All right, perfect. So welcome everybody. We are so excited that you're here. Like I said, I know it's a, a rainy day, but we are really glad that you are spending your lunch hour with us. So welcome to the Scope at Lunch, a special edition of the Scope podcast. My name is Paige Heitman and I'm your host for today's webinar. We're going to touch on just a couple of housekeeping items right before we get started. First, this Zoom session will be recorded and it's already recording. Um, so just know that going into this, we would like to know who everyone is. So please ensure that your name is accurate. If you need help with this, please reach out to us using the chat box feature. I'll be moderating the session with my Phelps Health marketing colleague, Hillary McCash. So one of us will be sure to help you if you need anything at all. Please note that each of you are currently muted. If you have a question that pertains to the topic being discussed, please add the question to the chat box and we'll try to get that question answered. You can also add comments in the chat box. One quick thing to note about the chat box is that you can send questions and comments to the whole group or just to one person. We'd encourage you to send your questions or comments to the whole group so that everyone can participate in the discussion. However, if you're not comfortable doing that, that is absolutely okay. Feel free to communicate with us however fits you best in your comfort level. We also want to encourage everyone to utilize the reactions that Zoom offers during this discussion today. You can use a hand clap, thumbs up, thumbs down, etc. to let us know if you like, love, agree, or disagree agree with whatever we're discussing today. Reactions can be found in two places, one either on the top or bottom of your screen and one that you'll see whenever you display the participant list. Also, if you're watching from our Facebook live stream, which is currently not live right now, um, we apologize for those technical difficulties. We'll make sure to share this after the fact and Hillary may be able to get it up and running in the middle of the show. So if you are watching from that, if that does pop up, um, feel free to ask questions, comment, show us emoticons during that conversation. We will be conducting a few polls throughout the Zoom meeting, so you'll get a chance to interact then if you choose. And of course, remember the chat feature. Some of you may be using a mobile device, while others of you are using a laptop or computer. If you find that your features aren't the same, we just ask that you participate with us however you can. If you have issues with your sound, the Zoom meeting, or other features, please use the chat box and one of our moderators will be happy to assist. So all of that being said today, our panel member today is Pamela Gray, a physician assistant with Phelps Health. Welcome, Pamela. We're so excited to have you. Thank you. I'm excited to discuss this topic. Yes, me too. I am so excited to learn a ton from you. So to get us started off, we are going to start with a polling question. And let me go ahead and launch that. So how stressed do you feel daily? Very stressed, kind of stressed, maybe just a little bit stressed, not stressed at all. Um, and not really stressed. So if you're not stressed at all, I would love to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yes. And these, again, are completely anonymous. So feel free to answer um, honestly. Give everybody about 10 more seconds to answer that. All right, we're going to go ahead and end the polling and share those results. This, Pamela, probably is not surprising to um, you or I. Most people are, you know, varying from either a little stress to very stressed. And then we have, you know, a couple people that are just really, really good at managing their stress. So kudos to you guys. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing this. And we're going to pop into our first question. So Pamela, how do we define stress? So stress is actually just the body's response, um, chemical changes such as hormones, to physical, mental, or emotional pressure. Great. You know, what are some of the main causes of stress? What are things that we can be on the lookout for? So some things, um, you know, some causes are stress we do ourselves, you know, we overschedule or we're not good at budgeting our finances or something like that. So we cause ourselves stress. Um, but there's other things that cause stress, like maybe being understaffed at work or working too many hours, um, financial insecurities, you know, racial bias, food scarcity. Um, exercise is actually a stressor to our body, a good stressor, but um, basically every experience we have can cause stress to our body. So along with that, can anybody experience stress regardless of age? Um, absolutely. And some of the new research that's out right now is actually showing how even like fetuses in the womb experience stress from like the mom 
and they actually um, changes biochemistry and help shape the neuro behavior of the fetus even before you're born. So kind of along with that, is it really important women who are thinking about getting pregnant or maybe they already are pregnant, should they really have a focus on, hey, I need to take things out of my life that are stressful or? Absolutely. Um, And because we all, you know, we are the carriers, you know, and uh, the stress we feel is brought on to the the baby and that's going to have, you know, effects on him, you know, temperament and behavior later. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's really great. That's something that I had never thought about before. So question number four, can the stress someone else is experiencing cause us to become stressed? So we know in a fetus situation, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But what about in everyday life? So absolutely. Um, And if you can really think about how you react when you're stressed, you know, are you irritable, short tempered, are you hard to get along with? Um, And just think of how that experience is experienced it is really affecting your kids or your coworkers or your spouse. If you're constantly, you know, snapping at them or short with them or something like that. So question number five, let's say that we are stressed and we're having a bad day. And what happens to our bodies when we experience that stress? Because we see it outwardly, but what happens inside? So I love to tell my patients that regardless of your ability to own up to you being stressed, um, your body is going to manifest that. So just because you don't want to say I'm stressed out right now, doesn't mean your body isn't absorbing that stress and changing, um, you know, so. So along with that, Pam, another question that often comes up whenever we're stressed is, can we handle stress for a certain amount of time? Or as soon as we recognize that we're stressed, is it, is it too late at that point? How do we know that we are mitigating our stress appropriately? So really, you know, if we think about what is happening in our body, when we are, you know, seeing that stress, um, the, the stress is actually to help us, you know, activate that sympathetic nervous system. So we can, you know, run from that bear or whatever the stress is. And we need that. We need that short-term epinephrine to just come into us and help us deal with whatever's there. Has that sympathetic nervous system, I think that's what you you just mentioned, has that changed over time? Because, you know, we're not really running from bears anymore, (laughs) right? We're running from things that happen in our daily lives. Maybe we get really upset on our commute to work. Maybe something happens in the work environment that causes us stress and we can't leave. So you're right. We're not running from a bear. That isn't our stress anymore. It's, you know, the person that doesn't use their blinker or the person that's driving too slow because and leave on time, um, that's really activating our sympathetic nervous system. And it's not so much that our body's reactions have changed. It's that our sympathetic nervous systems are staying on longer than they need to. So what do you mean whenever you say that they're staying on longer than they need to? Okay. So when we think about it, so let's say, you know, caveman Pam or cave woman Pam, Mm -hmm. um, sees that saber tooth tiger. And in my brain, it says we have to run, we have to get away. So immediately the amygdala, which is part of our brain perceives that perceives the saber tooth tiger or the bear or whatever. And it starts sending out distress signals to our hypothalamus, which really revs up our sympathetic nervous system. And when that happens, epinephrine is just pumping through our body over and over and over. And we want that to happen because we want our heart rate to increase. We want more blood to flow, you know, to our legs so we can run, you know. Um, But if we never have to run, right, then that energy is being wasted, right? And if the stress is actually a looming work deadline, that, you know, let's say is a week out and not that saber tooth tiger, you know, we're meant for that sympathetic nervous system to let us flee from the area. It's not meant to be turned on for a week while we're, you know, putting off whatever work deadline we're trying to avoid or um, whatever stress we have in our life that's, that's changing us. Yeah. And the stress that doesn't go away, right? 
<laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and pop into another polling question. I think this is a great transition into what Pam just shared with us. And again, these are completely anonymous. Feel free to answer these um, honestly. What are your personal methods to relieve stress? Maybe you like eating, um, sleeping, drinking, drugs, sports, exercise, shopping. Sometimes you use social media and you numb out a little bit so you don't have to deal with your stress. I know for me, I love a good sleeve of Oreos. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a shopper. Mm. <laughs> All right, give everybody about 10 more seconds. All right, we're gonna go ahead and end the poll, share the results. And it looks like 50, over 50% 50 of you guys are just like me. You also really enjoy sleeves of Oreos. <laughs> so it's great to know that I'm, I'm not alone. We also have quite a bit of people that, you know, love to talk with somebody. They love shopping like Pam. We have social media and then we have other as well. So those are people who maybe none of these apply to them, but you still have outlets um, for your stress. So we're going to go ahead and stop sharing that and move along. So question number six, Pam, is, you know, why do so many of us, like myself, reach to, to food for comfort when we're stressed? So really, it's, it's our body, is, it's telling us to do that, you know? So we see the initial threat, our amygdala starts sending out those danger system, um, receptors or signals, and we start producing that epinephrine. Well, our body can't maintain epinephrine for long terms, so epinephrine really turns into cortisol. So cortisol starts getting pumped into our bodies and that tells us we need carbs because we need energy. We need energy to run from, you know, the saber tooth tiger or the bear that's been chasing us for a week. So we need that quick fuel, something that our body's going to break down very, very quickly. Um, simple sugars, Oreos, um, to feed our brain and to give our muscles energy to run. So whenever that happens, do we actually use that energy or if we don't use that energy, what happens to it? So that, that's really the main problem that gets people, um, who are emotional eaters kind of in trouble. Um, because let's say we, we consume, you know, an extra thousand calories of Oreos or thousand calories of crackers or chips, whatever your vice is, well, we're not actually running, right? We're not doing that. We're just avoiding work or avoiding situations. Um, and that energy, if we don't use it is going to be stored likely in terms of, um, fat. And then we, you know, we end up with more calories than we need. And then we just kind of expand our waistlines. So. Yeah, it would be great if stress burned calories, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not what happens. So our next question is, can trying to lose weight cause stress? Absolutely. Um, you know, if you have a number in your head and you're going to get to it and you're trying to avoid, you know, certain foods or you're, you're going to birthday parties and you're not eating cake and people are talking to you and um, you know, all these kind of pressures that we put on ourselves in terms of weight loss can cause us more stress, which will, you know, cause our body to produce more of that cortisol and just make it harder for us to fight, you know, the urge to eat. So along with losing weight and how that may cause stress, can you gain weight from stress as well? So you wouldn't really it's not so much the stress, it's just your body's hormones making you hungrier. Yeah. So it has nothing really to do with the stress. It has to do with the, whatever's happening in your body. Right. And, and in terms of stress, your body isn't really focused on letting you burn up that energy. Great. So our bodies are built for survival. Mm -hmm. And if it's sensing a, a stressful situation, it's not going to let you release those calories it wants to save them all so we can, you know, run from the, you know, from the bear or the tiger or whatever it is um, that we need to run from. We're going to need energy to do it. So, yeah, it kind of creates this vicious cycle almost whenever you're stressed <laughs> because of cortisol, right? So that's why it's so important. It really does affect weight, but not mm -hmm. in the way that we think about. 
So question number eight, what forms of stress can weaken the immune system? So really it's, it's chronic stress that really kind of weakens our immune system. Um, not so much, you know, the epinephrine, if, if we get it and we actually run or we burn off those extra calories, um, that's not really the stress that's causing us issues. It's the long-term stress um, that really kind of increases inflammation in your body and can damage blood vessels and make you um, more at risk for like a cardiovascular event, such as a heart attack or a stroke. Perfect. Question number nine, how does long lasting stress, this chronic stress that you're talking about, how does this make us more vulnerable to disease? And you kind of just mentioned that. Mm -hmm. So essentially what it does is it just produces this inflammatory response in our body. Um, you know, like I said, weakens your immune system and weakens your blood vessels and puts you more at risk for, you know, strokes or heart attacks, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So whenever you're stressed, especially whenever it's chronic, it almost makes you more susceptible to like comorbidities, Absolutely. right? Because the person like me who every once in a while will eat a sleeve of Oreos, if that was an everyday habit, I can imagine how that would really affect my, my physical and mental well-being as well. Mm -hmm. So moving on to question 10, what are the physical symptoms that we can look for to kind of tell us we're stressed? How do we get ahead of it? So physically, you know, stress and stress and anxiety and depression and all these things really do have a physical um, impact on our body. Um, inflammatory things that can happen, you know, your skin could go crazy, you could start breaking out, your muscles will tense up. So um, if you start, especially women tend to get less chronic stress in their upper neck and back, and we kind of just walk around like this all the time. Um, we could be very tired. We could be very irritable. We could have more joint pain. Um, lots and lots of physical symptoms are associated with increased anxiety or stress. So when somebody has those physical type of symptoms, like you're describing, let's just use a female, for example, and they have this tightness in their neck that you're talking about, what can they do for that? Does it go away on, on its own if you stop being stressed? Um, it can. I mean, your body really is a pretty remarkable machine. Um, but lots of times I recommend, you know, massage, um, or, you know, muscle relaxers or just, you know, ibuprofen, something like an inset that takes away kind of the inflammatory response your body is having. Yes, absolutely. I could see how if my neck was hurting, that might cause me to have a headache and then I might be more irritable and then <laughs> I could be more stressed. Yes. <laughs> Because so, no one wants to be around a stressed out person. That's true. You're not wrong. <laughs> so question 11, how do we deal with stress differently now that there's more awareness on how mental health directly affects our bodies, our physical bodies? So hopefully we can find outlets for our stress um, or we can talk to people and give us checkpoints like, hey, um, you are stressed out right now. If you're not a person that can recognize your own stress, having someone that can just kind of do a, a timeout for you <laughs> it is awful, is sometimes helpful. So um, we just have to find outlets. Mm -hmm. Yes, even for adults, right? We learn this whenever we're children and, you know, we get upset or we're tired or cranky, whatever it is, we get put in a timeout or maybe we have to take a nap. But I think that's really applicable to adult life as well. Yes, absolutely. So question number 12, do introverts and extroverts, do they handle stress differently? Um, you know, maybe, um, for me, I'm more, I don't know, I guess I'm more introverted. I enjoy exercise and I like to do meditation. Um, if you're an extrovert and you don't want to be by yourself, you're probably not going to sit in a room and meditate. Yeah. So it just kind of depends on their personality, right? Right. Yes, because I'm, I'm more introverted than my husband, and oftentimes he will play video games with people so he can talk to people and de-stress at the end of the day, mm -hmm. whereas I like to be by myself for a couple of hours, and I really enjoy that, and that's how I recharge. Mm -hmm. So question number 13, does stress play a role in depression and obesity? And, you know, if it does play a role, what does that look like? Um, so it really goes back to those hormones in terms of obesity. So if you're under a lot of stress and your body's 
constantly producing cortisol. You're going to be constantly hungry. Um, the energy that you consume is probably going to be converted more to that belly fat, which is going to, you know, increase your insulin resistance, which is going to make it harder to lose weight. So it's just this vicious, vicious cycle in terms of obesity. Um, so is there a best place for people to have to store their fat? Can you tell if somebody is stressed just by their body composition? I mean, you probably can't tell just by looking at them. Um, a lot of times, you know, it's the centralized obesity or the obesity in the midsection um, that shows maybe you got a lot of cortisol running through your system. And, and that's really where you're storing your fat. Okay. So moving on to question 14, what kind of perpetuates the cycle of stress eating, emotional eating, and weight gain and loss? Um, So the cycle, I mean, it it all comes back to our hormones. Um, And not only that, but, you know, our body's producing cortisol, but then when we eat, our body releases dopamine, which, you know, kind of makes us happy. So it's, it's really the cortisol being like, I need to eat. And then you eat that that sleeve of Oreos or you eat that chocolate cake and all of a sudden your body rewards you for doing that with dopamine and you feel better. So how do we get dopamine without eating or, you know, doing, (laughs) doing these habits that maybe are not as fruitful for longevity of health? Um, so really one of the best things we can do is exercise and that's going to help us out. Mm -hmm. Does it matter what type of exercise you do? If you go and get super, super sweaty, is that better than walking? Uh, It's not. And I always try to to tell my patients, like, let's find some movement you enjoy. And whether that's yoga or whether that's, you know, a tough mutter or whatever gives you kind of that exercise induced high is is really what you want to go for. So we just want to put some good stress on our body in terms of of physical activity and get that dopamine pumping through our brain. Awesome. Can somebody tell whenever they have dopamine in their body, what does that feel like? Um, I mean, if you don't have it, you probably are going to have um, some symptoms of depression. Maybe you're fatigued all the time, or you just have no motivation to do anything, or, you know, you're 30 and all your joints hurt or Great. Yeah, that's good to know. I'm uh, in my mid twenties and I've had knee surgery. So if I don't exercise my knee, it gets really, really sore. And then by default, I get crabby. And then we, you know, (laughs) I overeat because I'm crabby. (laughs) So moving on to our next question, whenever we emotional eat, does sitting with our feelings help us feel better or does it just exacerbate the feelings that we're sitting with? You know, it kind of depends on how you've wired your brain to deal with those feelings. So if you are sad, like obviously eating some candy is going to make you feel better temporarily. Like it it is, but it's just science, you know, you're going to, your body's going to reward you for giving it what it thinks you need. Um, Or you can deal with that sadness and depending on how you've trained your brain to kind of deal with sadness you know, um, then that's really going to affect whether or not you're going to feel better or worse. So if somebody is struggling with emotional eating, or maybe they're just going through a a bad time, should they go straight to eating or should, should they take a second, you know, see if they feel better. And then if they still don't feel better after that time, can they go and have that treat or whatever it is? I mean, I would never say emotional eating is, mm-hmm. is bad because sometimes you don't have the mental energy to deal with, with what's a, what's causing you stress. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, sometimes it's just easier to grab a Reese's cup than go and tell someone that they hurt your feelings or maybe you're not there yet. Um, so it, it really just depends. I mean, if you're not doing it every day and it's not the only way that you deal with your feelings, it's really okay. Great. I think that's really good to know, especially as diet culture is so popular right now. I think it's really great to hear. You can have an Oreo if you're having a bad day. If you just went through a breakup, go and get some ice cream. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, my dad died last summer and I just remember being in the ICU and I'm, 
I really wanted an Oreo and I went to the vending machine and all they had were healthy snacks. And I'm like, this is not the place for your hummus. Okay. (laughs) I want Oreos and I want cheesecake and I don't want your crackers. Like it just, I love that. That Yeah. That's emotional eating put into practice, right? (laughs) (laughs) So moving on to our next question, does routine play a role in stress and weight management? Absolutely. So I, you know, if I have, you know, and I see a lot of females, so I'm just going to use the female example here. So we have a lot on our plate as, you know, females or working moms or, you know, a mom that doesn't work, we just carry this huge mental um, load. And so what I really tell my patients that are struggling with anxiety is we have to decrease that mental load. And sometimes the best way we can do it is through routine. So if I don't have to think about, you know, when, you know, everything I, I get at my house is through Amazon Prime. Okay. I don't think about toilet paper. I don't think about Dawn dish. So all of that is set up on a routine schedule and it just shows up at my house. So I never have to think about that stuff. Um, Same with kind of my kids routine in the morning. Everyone knows what's going on. We don't have any surprises for the most part. And I have more mental room to do things um, that I want to do or deal with the feelings that I'm having. That's perfect. I love that. So question 17, how do we recognize when we're full, when we're eating? What does that look like? Because maybe, you know, some people on here have a tendency to overeat because of their stress or feelings or whatever it may be. So I really think a a really good technique when you're feeling, when you don't really know if it's, am I eating emotionally or am I eating because I'm hungry? So take away all the external stimuli, okay? So if you can't figure out if you're full, get rid of your phone, get rid of your TV, and just sit with your meal. And the point where you start getting annoyed or bored or (laughs) whatever, you're probably full. (laughs) It's probably something else that's going on. I feel like I'm getting called out. (laughs) Uh, Yes, I have a bad habit of turning the TV on and and eating, right? But Mm -hmm. maybe I will try to not do that tonight. Actually, I will because I'm not eating at home. (laughs) So moving on to our next question, question 18. How can we eliminate stressful situations? So we can't, I mean, fully get rid of stress. It just, it's not, it's not something we can do in our society. Um, we just have to learn to manage them better. Um, and that's, you just can't, you can't eliminate stress. So, yeah. So for people who are, you know, dealing with stressful situations, which is everybody on this call, probably Mm -hmm. everybody that's tuning in, what are some ways that they can manage those stressful situations? What are some tactics we can use? Um, so just recognizing that it is a stressful situation is a really good place to start. Um, you know, denial is never, <laughs> never going to help you when it comes to dealing with stress. Um, you know, if you are constantly, let's say you're constantly stressed out about what you're going to make for dinner, well, planning what you're going to make ahead of time can make a difference. Um, and just, you know, just think about the the things that really stress you out most in life and then figure out how to make them so routine. It's not an issue anymore. That's great advice. You know, one thing that I do similar to how you do Amazon prime for all of your things, I do my grocery list two weeks out and plan out my meals two weeks out, which I don't have kids or anything. So uh, of course that is a little bit easier for me to do because it's me and one other person and then our dogs get fed. But for me, that removes a lot of stress because I don't have to think about what I'm eating for dinner next week because I've already planned it. Mm -hmm. So we have one more question before we go into questions from everybody who's on today. Who can we talk to at Phelps Health if we're struggling with stress eating or weight management? Maybe both. Um, so I would really just suggest going and talking to your PCP, um, your primary care provider. And if they're not comfortable with dealing with weight management or dealing with, you know, stress eating, there are other resources in, in the network um, that they can refer you to, to help you with, you know, weight management or stress. So um, just start with your PCP always. 
And if you don't have a PCP, now is the time to get one. Definitely <laughs> get a PCP. Yes. So now we're going to move into some of our participant questions. The One of the first ones that came through is, how can stress affect how I'm sleeping? Can it make a difference in the kinds of dreams that I have? Um, so stress really can play a role in how restful of sleep you get. Um, so if you are not getting restful sleep because your brain cannot turn off at night because you have, you know, 8,000 things running through it, you're not going to wake up rested. So when I was in PA school, I was, um, you know, there was a lot to think about a lot to learn. And I had to, I would literally wake up dreaming about pharmacology and different reactions. It was like, I never got a restful sleep ever. Um, so I started reading, you know, just junk fiction <laughs> at night and it was just something to turn my brain off. So I, I wasn't thinking about, you know, pharmacology in the middle of the night. So, yes, I love that. Um, something that I have a tendency to do, and this is how I know that I'm stressed is, you know, I'll have my day, I'll go to sleep and this is going to sound really crazy, but I will dream my day over. in in my sleep. And I'm like, okay, well, what happened today (laughs) that caused me to be stressed out that I had to relive it in my dreams? Yes. But to me, that's a great indicator that, okay, I need to do something different the next day or the next week or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So the next question we had is, how do you know you should talk to someone about depression? How do you know it's chronic versus a temporary feeling? What types of symptoms should you be looking for? And so depression, everyone, or not everyone, lots of people think it's just sadness. They're like, you know, you, you go, they'll come to me and and I'll ask them about their mood or their doctor will ask them about their mood. And they're like, I'm not sad. I'm fine. Um, But really it's a whole plethora of symptoms. You know, it can be aches and pains or just not having any motivation or poor sleep or wanting to sleep all the time. Um, So if you're experiencing any of those, please, 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 you know, reach out to someone and talk about it because depression is not just sadness. So another question that came through that, you know, you answering this is how do we support somebody that's struggling with depression? What does that look like? So, I mean, really just letting them know like, Hey, I'm here for you. Or, you know, if you are dealing with, let's say a mom, one of your friends that's depressed, you know, just showing up with a meal because lots of people don't ask for help. Um, it's just kind of our nature. Um, and you know, doing an Instacart delivery of, you know, food that their kids can eat, you know, (laughs) bread and, and deli meat or whatever, and some veggies, you know, that, that would be a huge thing to take off their plate for them. Great. I love that piece of advice. I think that is, that's really awesome. And that kind of hits the nail on the head. The next question we had that came through is making good food choices can be overwhelming. What is a good rule of thumb to follow as far as maintaining a healthy diet? So I, you know, we know what's healthy and what isn't. And if you don't know what's healthy and what isn't, come talk to me. But (laughs) for the most part, we really do know you know, what our plate should look like. We know that we should eat five to seven servings of vegetables a day, you know, all this thing, keep sugar minimum, but really it comes down to having a routine, especially if you're a busy, like working professional or parent, you know, for me, I basically have the same breakfast every day. Um, and I have a very similar lunch every day because that's easy for me. And I know they're healthy meals. Now, I'm not going to say I don't ever go out to eat for lunch or eat pancakes for breakfast, but for the most, most of the time, my breakfast and lunch are very, very healthy meals that I don't even think about because I just have them so regularly. I Um, love that. You know, that also made me think something that I do to, you know, stress and weight management is so tonight I'm, I'm going to eat dinner with my husband's family, but what I will do proactively so that I'm not stressed out about choosing what I'm going to eat, right, mm-hmm. um, is I will look at the menu ahead of time and right. already go through that and already have that decision made before I go to dinner so that I'm not stressed out or I'm not overwhelmed in front of a group of people. Mm-hmm. And I have, I mean, I have a teenager and he participates in like all the sports, you know, and so we're on the 
road constantly and we have to eat fast food a lot. And I literally have a healthy meal picked out at every single restaurant that we could potentially go for. And unless I'm, you know, craving a spicy chicken sandwich from Uh Chick-fil-A, I'm going to go with my healthy option because I'm ultimately going to feel better. If I'm having the craving, yeah, I'm going to eat the waffle fries or whatever. But for the most part, I don't even think about it. I have a healthy meal at every single restaurant we could possibly go to. And unless something else just looks amazing, that's what I'm eating. I love that. I, that is something that I do. And so I, I personally think that that's really, really great. Um, so the next question that came in was kind of about depression and counseling again. It says, my niece has stated that everyone should have counseling. Is this necessary? And how do you know if you need counseling? Um, so I love counseling. <laughs> I really do. Um, it is good for everyone. And I, you know, I would really say if you're struggling, like, just talk to a counselor. It's not something that you have to do, you know, every week for the rest of your life. Um, But if you're struggling at all, um, having that person on your side to kind of help you walk through things or, you know, having that bird's eye view of what's going on is really, really helpful. Yes, I I completely agree. I love, Judy, that you asked this because this is something that I'm also very passionate about. I think we can't take care of our physical health until we first address our mental health. Mm -hmm. But that's just my two cents. (laughs) I'm not a a PCP or a provider. That's just Paige. Um, So we don't have any more questions. So thank you so much to everybody for participating today and tuning into the Scope at Lunch. Um, A huge thank you to, to Pamela. You have provided us so much helpful information. And we really appreciate all of the insight that you've been able to share with our community. As a reminder, the show has been recorded and will be emailed to all participants. We'll also make sure to upload the show to Facebook so that you guys can share it with family and friends who maybe missed the show. And if you liked this show and want to know more, check out our other episodes of The Scope on YouTube or visit phelpshealth.org. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you.